at what point did you realize the significance of of the situation and and that actually it was kind of spiraling out of control and it was going to potentially cause some serious damage when i saw the fact that it was on page one three five it was <laughs> half the bloody papers and vote papers and it was really horrible when i read it i thought this is not what happened but um and then there were pictures of my house and my houses and everything and um it was really nasty welcome to beyond the fail the podcast where we talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about their biggest business failures we'll deep dive into how they overcame these setbacks the lessons they learned from them all to help you gain valuable insights failure is an essential part of the business journey as well as being the key to success. So we're here to show you how to thrive from it. Today, I'm super excited to say we have Gerald Ratner on. Gerald is one of the most famous business people of the 80s and 90s, having grown Ratner's jewelry stores to 2,000 retail stores across the UK and the US, employing a staggering 27,000 people, and having 50% of the jewellery market in the UK and was owning many of the big brands um, at the time, including um, H. Samuel um, and Ernest Jones. He was even a bit of a business celebrity of the day, regularly in UK newspapers and on TV, and had friends such as Charles Saatchi and Michael Grade, the Director General of Channel 4 at the time. But in 1991, Gerald made an infamous speech um, at the Royal Albert Hall where he described one of his products, a sherry decanter, as total crap. And that led to a media storm and one of the most famous PR disasters and business downfalls in modern history. And it's a moment that 33 years on is still referred to quite regularly in the media. Today, Gerald joins us and talks through this incident and what it was like to be on the front pages day after day in that media storm. He reflects back on that speech and the aftermath that followed and what he would have done differently. And he talks about how he's managed to come back and be quite successful despite the gravity of the fall. And this is very much the ultimate guest for this podcast, so I'm delighted to have finally got him on. So this is Beyond the Fail with Gerald Ratner. Gerald, thanks so much for joining me today and for your time. Really appreciate it and really excited um, for this conversation. We haven't got too much time, so I'm just going to kind of jump straight in. So you started at Ratner's when you were 15, and I think I read a quote when you said you were literally born into the business, because I think... You know, your mum was was pregnant with you when she was um, helping in retail stores. Um, And you've also said that you were more interested in business and your father's business particularly than your school work and um, and being at school. Do you think you would have been an entrepreneur if your father didn't run Ratners and run a business? I don't know. I really don't know. I I think uh, there is a bit of truth and it's in your blood and you see actors, children following in their career. I mean, it's more people do follow in their parents' careers quite a lot, and it's gone over, all over you know, for many years. And I was brought up in quite a, in an environment in North London where there were a lot of entrepreneurs um, and then the children then, carry, you know, became quite successful. So I don't know. I really don't know. I, I, I certainly was impressed with my parents and my father and wanted to be like them. Yeah. You, but you, I suppose most people are um, impressed with their parents and, and want to be like their parents unless they're parents <laughs> and murderers or something or thieves. <laughs> well, even when they're thieves, they tend to follow them in their... Uh, yeah, that's true. Making sure that is true. So was it your parents' influence? Was that the main influence on you going into business and following in their footsteps, would you say? 
Well, I wanted to go into my father's business um, when I was at school. And, um, you know, I didn't want to be at school, particularly. Um, I wanted to work. And, uh, yeah, at the age of 15, I did go in and work uh, in one of the shops behind the counter, which I loved. It didn't put you off working on the, you know, behind the counter? Well, I, st I did like selling. I, I always loved selling. And I wasn't good at administrative stuff um, or doing the displays in the window particularly. You had to clean the stock, and then there was quite a bit of... I was put, because I was the most junior, I was put on repairs, and that I didn't like. Um, not I had to repair the stuff, but I had to do the book work, which I never liked. Mm. But I liked, actually, the selling, uh, the customer. Um, so, yeah, I did that for quite a while. I mean, uh, you know, I didn't take over the business till I was 35, so that was 20 years. Um I worked in the company. And where do you stand on, I mean, you kind of touched on it, where do you stand on whether you think, you know, entrepreneurs are, are born or are they made? Well, there's a lot of people that have come from quite lowly backgrounds who have just decided that if they're not influenced by their parents, they're sometimes, sadly, they're influenced because their parents have done been poor uh, and they've mm. had so little that they've they want to make it. Eh? They've become even more determined. So it can work both ways, and um, you see this the people who have achieved absolutely rags to riches story because of the poverty uh, that they've been through. And it is a fact that a lot of big companies, including Marks and Spencers were started by immigrants uh, simply because of the fact that they came over to this country with absolutely nothing. Um, they, they, they didn't even have what poor English people had. They had nothing. So it was a question of they had to, uh, they had to make money. They had to achieve things. So, you know, there is some truth in people succeeding through adversity no absolutely and I, i've definitely spoken to quite a few people on this podcast who have come from difficult backgrounds poorer backgrounds and actually that's what's given them the the fight and the motivation to to succeed because they essentially don't want to repeat that for their children yeah and also i think that um some children that haven't had a lot of love and they've had a lot of humiliation, if you like, have gone out and tried to prove to everybody that they are not the idiot that people thought they were or their parents thought they were. And uh, some and, and sometimes when you're given everything, lots of love, uh, there is you don't have that much fight in you when you go out there to the workplace. So, you know, some people have got something to prove and they go out and prove it. And that actually leads me, segues nicely to a, com uh, a question that I wanted to ask because I've spoken to, you know, quite a few people on this podcast who had strong kind of powerful father figures and often that leads to feelings when they were younger of, you know, maybe being overshadowed by them. And wanting to step outside of the the shadows and having a kind of a point to prove, is that something that you can identify with at all? Did, did that ever kind of come up when you were younger? Did you feel that you had a point to prove and wanted to get out your father's shadow? Oh, definitely. And my father was a he was a really uh, autocratic, uh, larger than life figure. I mean, he was six foot two. Uh, he built the business, um, and he was, in those days, you know, he was highly regarded. He was extremely, he was looked up to by everybody, much more in a way than they perhaps look up to people today, I don't know. But he certainly was, and uh, yeah, I was certainly, you know, a young boy, left school, was in his shadow, and for many years, 
Uh, there's no question about that. Although we did get on very well. Um, you had to please him. You had to. You were fearful of him. I mean, he was in, uh, unquestionably uh, a domineering, aggressive. Um, he he felt he knew better than absolutely anybody else. Um, that didn't last forever, and that's how I ended up taking over the business because unfortunately he became ill and he uh, he he changed completely. Unfortunately, um, but yeah, he was an absolutely domineering figure that you were terrified of a certain degree. Wow. I mean, I, in a way, I was lucky. I was one of, uh, I was his only son and three daughters, and people said I was like his blue-eyed boy. But um, you still didn't want to cross him. So what effect did that have on you then? Particularly when you were younger, if he, if he, you know, you've said the words domineering and aggressive. and You wanted to impress him the whole time. You were, you were working completely. You were focused on everything you did was to, to impress impress him to achieve things um that in that he would approve of and you know um it, a lot of the time i didn't do that it was towards as i got older that i did do that and that was um that was what i wanted the the the, the route to success in my case was to get in his good books if you like did you achieve that? Um, yeah, I did. I did because I finally started getting more um, after working in the shop for years, working in the display department, working in the we had a factory, uh, working in. And then we had a fashion uh, division, which I, I was in charge of. So I was in so lots of different aspects of the business, which I didn't really succeed in any of them. But then when I started then just turning up at head office and started trying to, well, influence people other than him, strangely enough, coming, trying to influence him was the mistake that I made. Right. It was only when I started influencing the other people that I then, my status went up in the business and I could start making decisions. Uh, and one of the decisions that I made, even when he was in charge, was the fact that all our watches were sold at exactly the same price as our competitors. And I took the view that they was that was no good to anybody because we were sharing it all out in these branded watches. So I I reduced all the watches and put a poster up saying all our watches are sold at list price. This became extremely successful. So it wasn't a matter of... So in fact, I then got everybody behind me, other than my father, who actually it in the end, strangely enough. Uh, but that was the beginning of me really taking over from him because people were seeing that he was sadly uh, going backwards and I was making decisions that were working, uh, which was basically all about being more competitive and more aggressive in the shops. Because that sounds like a precursor to what you eventually brought in when you were uh, like CEO in terms of the whole like business model and the, you know, the I suppose that the strategy, which I think you've kind of referred to as in some ways like Primark, really. Absolutely. Primark, Weatherspoons, um, Ryanair, Sports Direct, Lidl, Aldi, um, Greg, if you like, they, I can name a yeah. few. Uh, that mm. I'm up, because the British market is, forget Bond Street and Knightsbridge, that, that's touristy anyway. But the rest of it, Liverpool, Manchester, Newcastle, Barnsley, Edinburgh, is a market um, where you have to offer value for money. Um, people want to want to want discounts, um, whatever, mark, whatever trade you're in. Um, so that was, I mean, to me, it's very simple. I mean, I was listening to Weatherspoon, guy who runs Weatherspoon, um, and he was saying that he would sell three pints of beer to 
his competitors two pints of beer so he can work on a lower margin. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. All the accountants in this world will try and bring in other things into the equation and balance sheets and whatever they've got. And but it isn't. It's just, it's just simple as that, really. And that's what we did. You know, you've got to get the product right as well. The product's got to look right. Um, it's no good selling the wrong beer or uh, the wrong food or the wrong jewelry. Um, but once you've done that, uh, you've got to be in. There is, you know, in this country, you're going to be successful if you're cheaper than anybody else. And do you think that those kind of, I suppose, economic conditions that you mentioned in all, you know, across the kind of country were more pronounced in the 80s when you took over? Well, it was the young people um, who had the money in those days, where nowadays the young people. And the ones who don't have the money, it's the old people that have the money. So the demographics completely changed. So it was more imperative than ever to be um, fashionable, competitive, and not have a sort of threshold barrier that the jewellers had. Uh, they were very snobby and they felt that the most important thing is to look like a bank and be very prestigious, when in fact it turned out that was exactly the and it was exactly the opposite that worked, and that's exactly what we did. So you're right, and what you're saying, what I did with the watches was a precursor uh, to what I suspected was the way to turn our fortunes around because because of my father's illness and the fact that they lost their way, we were losing, you know, the business was in loss, um, even though I had 130 shops. Um, and it, something had to had to change. Was it failing, would you say? Well, fact was that uh, it was still a public company and I think the writing was on the wall. When H. Samuel, the biggest jewellers in the country, uh, obviously without our permission, bought 20% of the, of the shares. Um, and that, when, we dis when I discussed it with my colleagues, not with my father, because you couldn't have a conversation with him at that time, sadly, um, it was clear that H. Samuel were going to... Um, make a takeover with a bit hostile takeover bid uh, and um, they had the money to do it and and um, we, we'd, I'd be out of a job I'd be the first one the boss's son I'd be the first one uh, to be fired uh, they say that the difference between a recession um, and a depression is that in a recession you lay off um you're some of your staff, but then in a depression, you lay off your relatives. <laughs> I think I got that right. <laughs> Something like that. That sounds about right. Yeah. So you, yeah, you, uh, did you feel under under threat then by that? Enormous. Personally? Enormously. Um, yeah, I mean, it was... Uh, did that speed things up? Did that speed your, did that speed things up in terms of you, you taking over the business? Yeah, I absolutely felt that... Uh, the final straw was that we had a buyer. He was falling, father was falling out with people and firing people. And the, the final straw was that we had a very good buyer who he fired. Or, or no, the bloke had just walked out because he was fed up with being shouted at the whole time. And he started his own business doing more or less um, what we were doing in the early days. Um, and he was being very, he was very successful. So... Uh, we didn't have a buyer, or we brought in the wrong buyer, we brought in somebody who was absolutely diabolically useless. And the buyer is the most important thing in in the retail. It's very simple. I mean, if you buy the wrong stuff, you weren't going to sell it. Uh, he was absolutely useless. Um, so, yeah, it, it was, I had to then um, say to him, and in fairness to him, he, he, he stood down. Um because he could see that the situation was, you know, going nowhere. And he, he in fairness, he gave me the chance. He, he handed me the reins and let me get on with it. I'm fascinated by that conversation. You know, you've described him as um, someone that you kind of looked up to, but you were fearful of, that was kind of domineering. And then you essentially had to ask him to, to step to step down and, um, you know, for you to take over. How did you approach that conversation? 
It was a typical Jewish family where the nobody. There were three brothers, my father and two brothers and his father. So it was a real family business. It was a typical Jewish family where they never spoke to each other. They were always rowing, and it comes to the point that they never spoke. It got to the point um, where it was ridiculous. There were no words exchanged at all between the four directors. So I came up with this brilliant scheme where I went to my father and I said that the three, your three brothers want you to step down because they don't feel you're, you should be. So it was a fate of complete for him that he would be voted off. So he had no choice. I then went to the three brothers and said that my father wants to step down. Um, so all of that was made up, but it worked. <laughs> it worked. Uh, as, as they never spoke to each other, they, they, they all thought that that was, that was what was happening. So um, he stood down before he was. He thought he was going to be thrown off, which he was never going to be thrown off. Um, and then, yeah, I became managing director and, and, and instantly uh, went down this road of aggressive marketing, lower price, playing pop music, um, incentivizing the staff. And it was somebody, the managers could see that somebody young had come in with different ideas and was things finally were going to get done because it was, you know, the business was stagnating because it was losing money. There was no investment, uh, the, there was no increase in salaries, and um, they, they got excited and everyone got behind it. And it worked. And in retail, if you change things, I brought in a new buyer who bought product which was much lighter weight, so the earrings actually have a plastic tube to strengthen them um, inside, but they're still gold. And everything was cheaper. We were buying it cheaper, and it was much more... The, the product was much more accessible to the younger generation. That's what they were looking for, something they would buy on a Saturday afternoon and wear that evening rather than a once-in-a-lifetime thing, which it was. So it totally transformed. Um hugely successful managers morale instantly went up and um yes we we then started making profits um again and more importantly um i then saw people that i knew friends of mine that were doing acquisitions this was something that had my father had never ever done one acquisition running a public company and the and I started doing acquisitions and buying out our competitors because we were doing so well. And of course, the big quantum leap was when we bought H. Samuel, which was ironic because, as I said, they were trying to buy us. Um, but by then, our policy of cut price aggressive marketing was hitting H. Samuel, which um, allowed me to at least get into the H. Samuel head office and discuss with the chairman uh, the idea of a merger. It was never a merger in my view, but that's how I sold it to him. Uh, and that was our quantum leap when we bought H. Samuel because it was a huge business, three times our size, much bigger shops, much better brand, fantastic staff, incredible locations. And um, we were suddenly went from this loss to 60 million profit, you know, and we were the share of the year. And um, it was a fantastic exciting time for us no there's some in a some there's some turnaround i mean was that h samuel merger i suppose that catalyst to to that success that you saw would would you have achieved it without that acquisition um because it, it sounds like that gave you firstly the coverage you know obviously I don't know how many locations you um, gained from um, merging, but also it gave you the profitability, so I presume, to then further um, your business in terms of more acquisitions and also, um, you know, achieve that kind of growth and, and really go aggressively into the growth. Yeah, well, Ratner's was never going to be... Um, we, you know, we ended up making £125 million pound profit. Ratner's in itself could never really make more because they were smallest shops it wasn't a huge business it never constituted as much as 
10% of our profits at any time. Well, we did obviously early on, but you know, at the end, it, it was it was less than 10%. But it would never, um, it would never, the Samuels put us in the big, big league. That's where um, there was no comparison with, with the, the size of the shops and, and, and the potential in that business. Um, because, I mean, it had been going 100, 150 years. It was, it was the number one. It was the leader. Um, so that when we injected our, our way of uh, trading into H. Samuel, uh, that was far more successful than doing it into the original Rannis business. And did that allow you to go into America as well? Or did H. Samuel already have presence in America? No, no, no. They didn't, and uh, yeah, that we we we'd had a string of acquisitions: Zales, Ernest Jones, um, Watch the Switzerland, um, Colin Woods, Weirs. We we had fifty percent of the jewelry market, and um, it got to the point where we weren't going to grow any any more. We weren't going to. You get to the law of diminishing returns because you know it's not like the supermarket business where. You can become Tesco. The market is a relatively small market uh, for jewellery compared to food or clothing. So we had to, if we want a public company, shareholders expect you to carry on increasing profitability so we could either diversify or or go to another country. So we we went, we went to America, basically they speak the same language. Uh, so it's difficult enough going to another country and not understanding what they're saying. Um, so, uh, anyway, America was a much bigger market and, um, we were actually the one of the, I think possibly the only retailer at the time that, that went across the Atlantic and succeeded, um, Tesco, Marks and Spencers, they all failed, uh, because of the fact that the market is so different to how it is in the UK. Um, it's a graveyard for retailers. But we succeeded simply by not trans transporting our formula, however successful it was across the Atlantic, by basically buying at a ridiculously high price the best business out there, paying, uh, yeah, as I said, over over the top for it, but knowing that that was the blueprint, that we could roll it out, because it was in every mall that we visited, it was taking more money than any other jewellers. So we liked the management, we liked the fact that they were charging 42% on their in-house credit card, uh, which a lot of people couldn't handle because it was before the internet and stuff like that, but they had great systems for that. Um, where The most important thing in America is knowing what your customer wants. Um, and they had information on all the customers. And they used to phone up and say, you know, do you know it's your uncle's birthday next week and they, we've got a signet ring and you've got enough headroom on your credit card to buy it and they knew everything about it and of course in America they're very receptive to that type of selling in the UK they'd slam the phone down on you so you know we learned a lot about America but we did it in a totally different way than we did it in the UK that's pretty advanced isn't it for the 1980s without uh, I suppose you know I only suppose basic computers that you've got that level of of customer information to be able to do that upselling they were ahead of the game. Yeah, they had loads of computers, whereas a lot of companies didn't. We did, but there was the, the but there was no internet. Uh, the computers were pretty big, um, but they gave us all the information, uh, a lot more information than um, our our competitors had, uh, and that was the key to it. I mean, the the reason that Amazon are, are successful is because they have these what do you call them, where they know everything about the customer. I've forgotten the word for it, but you know what I mean. Um, which thing? Yeah, big data, yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, at your height, you know, it's a it's a very impressive kind of turnaround. You know, I think you were, I think Ratners was making, what, a £34,000 loss, something like that, it, it, you know, when you took over and then you took it to 2,000 stores, 27,000 people employed, 50% of the jewellery market in the UK, um, as you said, uh, I think £150 um, million pound profit, which is all a, a kind of incredible um, in figures. And then obviously, 1991. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, I'm coming to it. Um, but, and obviously that was the, your kind of peak. And then 
obviously we fast forward to kind of 1991 and the um april 1991 and the your kind of now infamous speech at um the royal albert hall with the institute of directors where you know you told two jokes in the speech and they were very much taken out of context and kind of misquoted in the media the next day and it caused um very you know this is a very underestimating phrase but you know a media storm really and it was front page news for kind of many days and weeks do you blame the media for misquoting you well the media did misquote me because they said um that i all my that i'd quoted me as saying all my jewelry is crap that's how i was successful but i don't blame them for for being disingenuous simply because of the fact that I should have realized that they are disingenuous. Um, mm. Every time you read something in the press, it is it is exaggerated, it is inaccurate. I mean, that is the tabloids. Um, that Everyone knows that. You do, if The few times that I happen to know the inside story of a particular thing that I've read in the tabloids, I, I, I think this is not what happened. Uh, so and so doesn't have three children he doesn't live there or she doesn't do that and you think you got it all wrong but it's just have a but that is the the idea is to go do a story that is of interest and sometimes if you if you just report something exactly as it happened it's mm -hmm. not really um big enough story so i should have front page news it wouldn't be for yeah so they made this um into something which it wasn't but i should have I should not have um, made, I had made those jokes before and I'd got away with it and nobody um, had criticised me for making those jokes about the sherry decanter and the prawn sandwich. Um, so I found it funny. But um, the Daily Mirror decided to make a story of it, to misquote me. Um, apparently uh, the journalist had it in for me because I'd fired his niece um, I never met his niece, but anyway, um, and it sounds like because I, you know, I've heard you say that before as well. Do you, have you? I mean, it sounds like you had a bit of a vendetta against you. Do you blame him for this? Because technically, you know, you said that you made these jokes before. Other people in the press had heard these before, but it seemed to be really it was him really that was the epicenter of this. Yeah, he 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 kicked it off. Because although the sun ran with it in a big way, they basically copied the mirror story completely. In fact, they changed their headline overnight because they weren't even running that story. Um, so do I blame him? Um, well, there's no point, is there? I mean, uh, he got a big story out of it. People have done worse things to get big stories. I can tell you that. Um, that's the nature of the beast. So... Um, Nowadays, people are more careful. That's why when you hear people being interviewed, like politicians or something, they don't actually say much because they're so defensive. Uh, they're so, they know that they're going to get misquoted. They know that it's going to get exaggerated. So they actually say absolutely nothing. Um, but yeah, I um, was totally out of order making those jokes. It was... Um, every, it was a big mistake, and it, it was I was overconfident, arrogant, um, and I should have been more careful and measured um, in the speech. I wouldn't have got the the laugh. I, I think it was a bit of being nervous about speaking at the Albert Hall in front of six thousand people, and you wanted to make a joke to cut the ice and get them on your side because that's what works in a speech. If you do a deadly, dull speech and you don't get any noise from the audience, which I've seen at the Albert or uh, other IOD events, but um, I would find it, my delivery would struggle uh, because I wouldn't feel as confident because I didn't. I feel I wouldn't have won over the audience because it, I did win over the audience in that speech because nobody in the Albert Hall um, thought there was anything untoward about those jokes. You know, what you do with speeches, you do say things a little bit controversial. I mean, I've listened to the audio and um, there's people are finding it really hilarious. You know, it goes down really well. Yeah, that's right. And that helped me uh, deliver it. Uh, and that helps me today when I do my speeches. 
uh, to you to engage the audience in humor that if you want to get a serious message you're not going to get it across if you just um don't try and engage the audience get them on your side and the way to do that is with humor um which is what i do today and um ironically i've been doing it for 20 years and uh must have you know done over five thousand speeches in those 20 years oh. you know so i don't actually i don't even know if it's i haven't been counting but i've done a hell of a lot <laughs> mm. and going back to that point at what point did you realize the significance of of the situation and and that actually it was kind of spiraling out of control and it was going to potentially cause some serious damage when i saw the fact that it was on page one three five it was <laughs> half the bloody papers and vote papers and it was really horrible when i read it i thought this is not what happened but um and then there were pictures of my house and my houses and everything and um it was really nasty and you know cells started um word was going around people were making jokes at you know celebrity people on tv it was like the, the, the it was like the topical joke um it was horrendous and uh you know, the, you get really, your staff tell you what's going on. I mean, you look at the sales figures, but you were seeing that people were coming in, asking for their money back. There was a lot of hostility. Whereas before the speech, it was exactly the opposite. You know, people were asking. Mm -hmm. They weren't selfies, but they were asking for my autograph when I went around for shop customers in there and everything. And um, the it was a completely the opposite. I was being, there was queues of people wanting the money back and when I visited the shop I got a lot of abuse so um and this and the sales started going down uh, we were always how quickly did that happen after the event when you set when it started to impact on sales and in people started demanding refunds what was the timelines it, it took a, it took surprisingly it took longer than you think um because after a few days I thought it would it was blowing over because we were only about five percent down but then after about, it's a very strange thing. I don't understand it, but people, um, it, it just takes a while for it to, you know, there was no internet or Twitter or something. So it took, true, the news traveled much slower, even bad news. Um, and it said so people hadn't even read, the, even though the problem was that the sun and the mirror kept going on with this. And... Mm. They had huge circulation. Um, the Sun, I think, had about 12 million. The Mirror had about 8 million. Um, today, the Sun has about 2 million and the Mirror has about one and a half or something. Uh, so people got their news. My customers got their news from that. Today, it's much more fragmented. You get your news from lots of different places, mainly social media and stuff, YouTube. Um, so... Um, yeah, people, nobody by an engagement ring, I get down on one knee with ratness on the lid anymore, where it's the, such a powerful brand, um, it had gone toxic. And that was the thing, it was the brand aspect of it, which is, you know, the reputation. I've heard you say before that if you were a supermarket, it would have been completely different because there's no kind of brand loyalty or brand differentiation differentiator between you know uh a sort of tesco's baked beans you know and obviously it's very different in the jewelry market yeah that's right i mean we were still selling seiko watches and uh rotary watches and S accurist and swatch uh because that was those brands but when it came to engagement rings um it is the brand that is on your fascia in the jewelry business um it is the only business I know where there isn't brands other than watches the jewelry does not have a brand I know um, you know even you go to opticians and they have designer brands and stuff like that or you run there was no the branding is is the brand is the fascia name on the fascia so yes it was uh, I would have gone away with it if you'd like if it was in any other uh, industry mm. and I'm really fascinated by 
how you approach the crisis management at, at that point were you having kind of like a war kind of committee like every day on this trying to you know contain the you know the incident was that how it was working how, how did you kind of approach that well i started doing these 25 percent offs everything um try and bribe customer back um the problem with that was that we did it on the Saturday and then, yeah, people came in and bought a lot of branded watches and stuff like that and they even bought some jewellery. But the days where we weren't doing it were completely dead, um, so it really didn't add up to very much. We did a advertising campaign getting celebrities like Paul Gascoigne and Sharon Davis. Is it Sharon Davis, the swimmer? People like that. Oh, yeah. People who were popular at the time to say how wonderful and awareness. it didn't make a blind bit of difference you were pissing against the wind and people had the people just assumed that everything we saw was crap <laughs> and I'm also interested to see what your kind of messaging was internally to your to your staff because obviously you had 27,000 staff, which is obviously, I can't even comprehend, you know, um, mm. that. And particularly in the age of not having email to be able to communicate with that many people, what did your internal communications look like to reassure staff of, you know, because they, they're they probably reading it in the paper. They're obviously going to be quite fearful of their jobs and the impact. How were you kind of managing that and containing it internally? Well, everyone likes working for a successful business. That's why we had a very high morale. Um, and now we'd become a laughing stock. And when the people said they worked for Ratners, um, he, he, the morale was ridiculously low because of that. So I called them in um, and we kept trying to come up with new strategies to overcome the problem advertising campaigns or slogans or offers or we even changed some of the shop's names nothing worked just got worse and worse um, it was a hopeless it was a hopeless uh, situation i think i don't think there's anything anyone could have done about it so did you ever send out any like memos to staff just trying to reassure them, you know, particularly the beginning, the first few days, I presume to say, you know, we're going to, this is, this is going to blow over kind of thing. Well, because everybody thought that I'd said it about my jewelry, uh, I did a letter, um, which we plastered on the window of every shop saying that, um, why I actually did say that I never called my jewelry crap. Um, it was just a, Sherry decanter said that we'd inherited new Bill H. Samuel. Um, and then I went on uh, Terry Wogan's show uh, to try and apologise, explain about the situation. Again, all these things just made it worse. Uh, right. You're just attracting attention to it more and more so. Mm. The more you talk about it, the more everybody else does but what do you do you think there was anything you could have done differently which would have which would have i suppose nipped it in the bud or, or lessened the impact i don't know i tried everything i could i don't know looking back i don't know do you think you responded fast enough i mean what when did you go on wogan for example was that um was that what that sort in of... the, the same day same day within two days right. within two mm. days in fact they kicked somebody off to take me on with that person got very annoyed about it <laughs> um but yeah i could have gone on anything then everyone was asking me to go on right. um you know breakfast tv all the news that's everybody um but i chose wogan because i've been on it before um but that didn't that just basically informed a lot of people didn't even know about the story that blow it up further Exactly. If you make a mistake, um, then broadcast it. <laughs> but I've heard you say that you felt that you could have been potentially stronger in your approach and maybe given a stronger apology. Is that is that true? 
I think that if people do screw up, even though they feel a bit hard done by by it, uh, and the fact that they feel that um, it's not completely their fault, you're better off really making a full apology, putting your hands up, blaming yourself, saying that there's no excuse, it's an absolutely ridiculous thing to do, totally wrong. And then I think that's the only thing that can uh, can work in, in terms of the general public and that they can have some empathy uh, with that because they realize that you know everybody makes a mistake and if you really own up mm. to your mistake, say what you did with that, um, then you've got a chance and perhaps yes. Um, but then I still think that people would have still thought everything I sell is crap because I that's the way it was reported in all the papers mm. that I've gotten that everything all my jewelry is crap and that's how I've tricked the public and, and that and so that nobody's going to go down on one knee with a ratness on the lid <laughs> or, or you can even give it as a Christmas gift with ratness because mm. it's the with the jewelry it's all about the name on the box it's about the prestige yeah mm. And you were friends with some quite high file, high high profile people at the time, uh, like Charles Saatchi, I read, and and Michael Grade, the controller of the BBC and uh, director general of Channel Four. Did you ever reach out to anyone in your like circle like that? You know, that were kind of, I suppose, um, business people or people with um, profile that you know maybe had some experience of kind of PR. Did you ever reach out to them for advice or support? Yeah, I reached out to all of them. Um, and they all gave me advice, which none of it was any good. <laughs> um, what, what did they say you should do? Well, we got Sir Tim Bell, who was Margaret Thatcher's advisor. He said, you have to talk to the public like you're talking to a single person. Um, I don't really understand that, but I remember him saying that, um, Others said that, um, well, there was one other thing that I, I had said about a book, which is not a real book uh, that we sold. It was a pretend book. It was a coffee table book with antique dust on it. <laughs> and I'd made a joke about that. And um, somebody said, I should just say that's a shame because I like reading books. So that actually made it worse. Actually, a lot of the advice I got was was the wrong advice, which is often the right. case in everything. Um, yeah. Um, every bit of advice I got was the wrong advice. One, one advice I got was to then stop talking to the press and that made it worse because I was always accessible to the press and they said, oh, you know, you were happy to talk to us about your successes, but now you've got this problem, you don't want to talk to us. Um, and they, they, the, the PR people started talking to the press and they made it far, far worse. They got everything wrong. We brought in some, one of these companies that deals with disasters, I mean, P or Slick and something like that. Yeah. Um, so they, they they distanced me away from the investors and the press, and that was that was wrong. But quite honestly, I don't know what would have been right, but everything we did was wrong to try and fast. Do you think that it it uh, had the perception then of you being sort of running away or hiding then with yeah. less accessibility to the press? Yeah. And just sort of wanted to take, uh, well, talk about uh, decision making and, you know, decision making under pressure, because obviously this was a, you know, an extremely high pressure situation, you know, your share price um, plummeted, and I think 500 million pounds was wiped off the share value um, in kind of less than a month. And after, well, in the aftermath of all of this, you brought in a, a chairman to deflect some heat. Is that something you regret? Yeah, very much so. Because he fired me. 
Did you have any other options? Yeah, not to bring him in. But I was again, as uh, Sir David Alliance, uh, the chairman of Coach Viola, said to me that I should split my roles so I could. He'd spoken to the city and they felt that I could still run the business, but I needed a chairman to front the business and protect me from everything. He could deal with the press, he could deal with the investors, but I could run the business rather than being the face of the company. And he persuaded me to bring in this guy. So I, that was another bit of advice that uh, backfired. That, in fact, that was the worst bit of advice. That was the most you know, expensive bit of advice. Of all. Was there any other options for him? Because I've heard you also say that you felt your position was untenable. So was there any other uh, options for him to keep you as um, you know, CEO? Well, I think he was always going to get rid of me. I should have realised that it was always that was always his plan. But you know, I'd got rid of quite a few chairmen in my day. I got rid of the chairman of H. Samuel. Mm. I got rid of the directors of Ernest Jones. Um, so I'd fired people. Um, so there you go. You live by the sword. You die by the sword. <laughs> but you said you regretted it. But I mean, how would it have played out if you'd stayed on as? chair and CEO? Well, the fact was that our American business, although I had a bad year of the year of the speech because they were also in recession, but in America they recover much quicker out of recession and America recovered in a massive way and today the big the business Ratner's renamed Signet but it still consists of the same parts. Um is about five billion pound business. So presumably there's no reason why it wouldn't be at least there if I was still running it. So I suppose that could have been one of the options you stayed on and just rebranded, right? Well, the fact was they closed the Ratner's shops, but as I said, the Ratner's didn't consist of, uh, didn't produce a huge amount of profit compared to America and H. Samuel. Um, but, but America, um, and then Ernest Jones has done very well um, because the market's changed now. Ernest Jones sells Rolex and stuff. Um, Samuels hasn't done that well, but America's done very well. Um, so, yeah, that's what, that was it. And I don't know what, Ratner's, I don't know what would have happened with, with Ratner's. Uh, if I would have stayed, I don't know, but I was already... You're part of the fact, of the decision that it was going to be closed when I was there. Mm. So obviously, you were, you know, ousted as as um, CEO, and then you know you, you you've been quoted as saying that you spent um, seven years in bed watching Countdown, uh, and I think you know you were prescribed Prozac. Is that right? Yes. And. You know, I've I've got a quote here where you said, you know, you were seriously depressed and found it difficult to um, kind of carry on or get out of bed. How bad did things kind of get in those darkest days? Well, they <laughs> they got very bad. Um, and it was only when I took up uh, road cycling that um, I started feeling better about myself. Some people, it works when they take. Uh, pros out because um, you don't feel so bad but then again it doesn't really help you think sharply and get back on your feet and become particularly ambitious so it was when I gave out that and started cycling that um, I started thinking about thinking better more positively uh, and I could see the benefits of um, <clears throat> exercise I still do it to this day, I still cycle 25 miles. And um, so I decided I had to open up a health club. Um, and even though I didn't have any money, um, I took a, I put a site that I found into a solicitor's hands and sold membership on the back of the fact that I said that I had bought it, which I hadn't. 
um, and got 800 members, which enabled me to raise the cash because I was completely skint. Opened up a health club, sold it two and a half years later for four million pounds. Um, and that was, um, that was, you know, as I said, it took seven years um, to get back on my feet. Uh, but it was a great feeling to get back on your feet uh, after going through what I went through. No, absolutely. And I, I love that story uh, about, you know, what you did with that health club and and the kind of, I suppose, calculated risk that you took with that. Did you ever have any doubts about your abilities in, in being an entrepreneur and being a, a, a you know, a business owner after what, what happened? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I, I started believing what I was reading in the press that I was unemployable. I think it's very strange because they were lauding me and saying what I'd have achieved. It was retail of the year. Uh, I was the only one to find the recession. Um, I couldn't have got better press. And then suddenly um, I was this idiot that was incapable of doing anything. Um, it must be really hard because it's like personal attack really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's life. Life is difficult. Is that one of your learnings from from this whole of, event that, you know, life brings you these challenges? Was that a viewpoint that you had before this happened? No. And I do think the fact that um, you people who have had a setback, in my case, slightly bigger than a setback, but mm. I do think that um, you can then deal with everyday problems um, they don't seem so bad um, you can handle them instead of um, overreacting to the day to day problems that we all have if you've been through something what I've been through a lot of people have been through a lot worse mm. um, you toughen up which is good because you do need to be tough because things happen to us all whether it's personal or business, money problems, uh, that's what's going to happen in life. So if you have, if you can, if you don't sort of fold over at the first thing, um, you can deal with it. You're going to, you're a happier person uh, for it because, um, you know, all these things that happened to me today, um, don't bother me so much as they used to do. Would say you're more resilient now. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And uh, you know, a lot of people aren't these days. Um, which is, you know, if you're weak, you will suffer. And, you know, I'm much tougher for this, this experience. And I suppose a related question to that, just for, I suppose, for the audience. Um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs or, you know, want to be entrepreneurs get held back by um, the fear of, of failure and the shame that may follow so they don't ever start anything. What would your advice be to them? Well... I think that, uh, you know, if you're going for a, if you want to be a footballer, um, you can't expect to win every game. You can't expect to be the, even Manchester City, you can't win the league every year. Um, you've got to take the rough with the smooth, but you've got to do everything you can to make sure that you do succeed. But inevitably, however good you are, um, there will be failures along the way. And um, it's good to fail because you really then appreciate your successes. Now, if you if you have from one success to the next, you would you wouldn't really uh, you wouldn't really get a lot of pleasure. Is when things really go wrong, you manage to overcome them, or you've been through difficult things and then you turn them round that you really get pleasure out of it. So wrapping up, and this might be. Uh, you know, a silly question, but if you could go back in time and erase that speech from ever happening and the whole fallout from ever happening, would you do that? 
That's an interesting question because of the obvious answer is you would have raised it. And I probably would because of the fact that a lot of people lost their jobs other than me, a lot of young people who had given a chance to running shops. Um, but on the other hand, I have learned a very good lesson that to appreciate things. And although my business is today nothing like the size of my business, I do appreciate things much more. Um, I can cycle 25 miles a day. I wouldn't be able to do that if I was running a public company, so I've got a better balance in my life. Happily married for 35 years. I don't know whether that would be the case with the way I was going, running the business. Uh, so there's a lot, and most importantly, probably, well, I would, actually, I should say the marriage is the most important thing, but secondly, most importantly, <laughs> is this week. I really do enjoy doing public speaking, uh, travel all over the world. I mean, I'm going to places like um, Seychelles, Italy, Germany, all over the place and um, telling my story um, and getting fantastic uh, reception from it. I don't know why it's so good, but people seem to identify with ups and downs and calamities that happen in business. They'd rather hear about that than all the successes. So I wouldn't be doing that uh, if it wasn't for that event. Mm. Amazing. There's always a planning. No, absolutely. I think that's a, 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 a very good message to, to kind of end on. We do always end with a quick fire round though. So I have a series of, of short questions and the, you know, your answers should be uh, as short as well. So first question, failure is, it's inevitable. <laughs> what is your life's mission? Um, I suppose to be happy and to um, make sure that my family are happy. What's one piece of advice that you would want to give to other people on your deathbed? Well, I would say that... Uh, as somebody once said, I forget who, nobody lay on their deathbed until they should have spent more time at the office. And I do feel that uh, uh, I was in a bit of a rut, you know, working where I did. And there's a lot more to life than just making money and working the whole time. And uh, so, yeah. Name one habit that keeps you resilient. My cycling. Definitely. If you could be immortal and live forever, would you take it? Um, well, I'm 74. And um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, I really can't answer that. Uh, um, I won't be offered that, so there's no point. <laughs> Sorry to end on a, on a... It was the only question that I couldn't answer. Um, if uh, if you could swap places with another business person, who would it be and why? I would like to swap places with Dame Sharon White because I think she's absolutely run. She's made all the wrong decisions at John Lewis. I think it's a wonderful business uh, with wonderful staff and she's absolutely wrecked it. First thing she did was take down the sign, never knowingly undersold, quite beyond belief. Um She's tried to diversify into property when she's sitting on a bloody gold mine. Why don't you concentrate on that? Um, the morale in the business is ridiculously low. All those things can be fixed because it's basically an H. Samuel. It's a wonderful business. And um, so, I, you know, I'd like to go in there and turn that round, um, which I think I could, even though. Well, they do sell jewellery, actually, but that's only a very small part of it. But retail, I'm never a jeweller. I'm just a retailer. Mm. Interesting. So who do you think you could recommend that you think I should have on as a guest? Um, what about Natalie, my partner in Gerald at Friends? She I've had is, Natalie on. Oh, you've had her on. Well, there you go. Yeah. She's good value. Um, have you had Rob Moore? I've not had Rob on, no. No. Well, he's the voice of Britain today. He's always on the blink. 
somebody I really admire who's actually given me a lot of speeches and um, he's been great. Okay, fantastic. So, Gerald, where can people find with you, well, find you and connect with you? They can email me at Gerald Online, Gerald at GeraldOnline.com. I'm on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and um, Instagram. Perfect. I will put all of that in the show notes. And you've got how many books now? Three? Two. And the one with Rob? Yeah. No, I've got my autobiography and one with Rob. That's it. Right. I'll put all that in the show notes as well so people can um, read uh, your brilliant story um, in f more depth. So, Gerald, thanks so much for your time and for all your honesty and talking about you know these difficult kind of subjects. I really appreciate it. Okay, Jess. See you soon. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Fail. Really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Please do subscribe to the show and leave us a review. It really does help us to grow and to reach more people. Do follow us on social media too. We're at Jeswood on Instagram and at Beyond the Fail on YouTube and also on Linktree. Thanks again and see you soon.